Hi there. Welcome to this session, Angles at 200. My name is Sebastian Budgin. This is the Historical Materialism 2020 online conference. Um, this session has two speakers, Michael Roberts and Camilla Royal. Um, Michael Roberts will be familiar to lots of you. He runs the blog at uh, thenextrecession.wordpress.com. Uh, which has excellent conjunctural and theoretical analysis uh, on a very regular basis. He's also um, the author of several books on Marxist economics, uh, including two published by Haymarket Books, The Long Depression in 2016, and he's the joint editor of an excellent volume with Riemi Karkedi, World in Crisis 2018. He also published a book, book, Marx 200, which discusses the re relevance of Marxist economic analysis in modern capitalism to coincide with the 200th anniversary of Marx's birth in 2018. And now he's just published a book called Engels 200 about Engels's contribution to the political economy, to political economy for the 200th anniversary of Engels. Engels' birth. And uh, the title of uh, Michael's paper is Engels and the Dialectics of Nature. And uh, after Michael, uh, Camilla Royal will be speaking on uh, Engels and Ecology, the Urban Political Ecology of Friedrich Engels. Camilla is, uh, teaches geography at King's College London and is the author of A Rebel's Guide to Engels, published by Bookmarks in 2020. And she's a contributor to a forthcoming collection called Re-Examining Engels' Legacy in the 21st Century, which is edited by Kohei Sato and Terrell Carver. So, uh, both will speak for 20-25 minutes, um, and then we will be feeding through um, questions from our YouTube channel, which I will <coughs> be reading out, and Michael and Camilla will be responding. Michael. Well, thank you, uh, Seb, for the introduction. Um, it is an opportune moment for historical materialism, uh, the conference online this year, to discuss uh, the contribution that Engels has made uh, to political economy and to Marxism in general. A close friend and collaborator with Marx for over 40 years. Um, and in many ways, Engels' contribution to Marxism and to historical materialism has been neglected or sidelined because of the great uh, shadow of work uh, from Karl Marx. But it's just three weeks from today, November the 28th, when we will reach the 200th anniversary of Engels' birth in Western Germany. And so it's an opportune moment to discuss uh, his work. Uh, in this particular session, I'm just going to concentrate on Engels' view about the relationship between capitalism and nature. And uh, you can see in the first graph that uh, we have a, the argument, the title, title, the dialectics of nature. I'm not going to be able to discuss the full, uh, comp encompass the whole, uh, whole positions that Engels has on the dialectics of nature, but I want to concentrate in particular on the relationship between uh, capitalism and nature and Engels' understanding of that. In the uh, next graph, you can see that um, we have two ecological crises of capitalism at the moment. It is a very opportune moment for us to discuss the question of the relationship between capitalism and nature and Engels' contribution. On the one hand, we have this COVID pandemic which is spread across the world and is creating the conditions where there's been a huge increase in the number of deaths, excess over what is normal. The two graphs here on the left shows you, the red line shows you the uh, excess deaths in the US over the last six to eight months since the beginning of the year. And you can see that in no way is uh, the COVID pandemic just another flu or just something else not to be worried about. And if you look on the right-hand graph, you can see the percentage of excess deaths over normal um, in this uh, pandemic. Uh, so anything between uh, 25 to 50 percent in some of the major European economies, including the UK and also the US. In the next graph, what is shown clearly 
and as we've been revealed by the nature of the COVID pandemic, is that it is a product of capitalism's expansion into all parts of the globe through industrial farming, through fossil fuel exploration, through timber logging, through mineral exploration, and urbanization on an unprecedented scale to the point where remote areas of the world uh, where wildlife has been untouched by contact with humanity and also has within it uh, seems a range of pathogens and viruses which are deadly to humans as well as to animals. And we've now known that from the spread from the wildlife into animals that are being industrially farmed into humans, uh, we end up with a series of pandemics uh, that we've, and the, this is just the latest one, COVID-19. In the next graph, we have only this week to hear the news that it's not just a Chinese flu, as President, sorry, soon to be ex-President Trump has called the COVID-19 pandemic, but also in Denmark, we now find out that human beings, fur farmers, have infected the minks that they've been keeping in tiny cages. And as a result, now the minks have started to come back and infect a whole range of uh, uh, people in Denmark, forcing the closure of this particular nasty fur trade through the culling of all the minks. So we have a zoonotic process by which animals are uh, transporting dangerous pathogens to humans. And now it would seem through mutations back into animals and then an unending process between the two. This is the disaster we're in, the challenge that faces us at the moment as a result of capitalism's expansion. In the next graph, the other uh, big climate uh, issue, planet issue, is of course the climate change emergency, the massive expansion of fossil fuel uh, production and uh, the use of that in all aspects of uh, uh, production and services has meant, and transport has meant a huge increase in the warming up of the world, way beyond pre-industrial levels. And it's now estimated within the next five years, uh, there is a very good chance that we'll be at least 1.5% deg 1 degrees centigrade warmer than pre-industrial levels, the level which the Paris Agreement set, set as trying to control. We're going to exceed that comfortably, um, as the figure on the right already is demonstrating the pace of that growth. In the next graph, I bring you to the question of coming back to where what Marx and Engels had to say about the relationship between capitalism and nature. Um, it's a charge presented against uh, Marx and Engels that they're they had a Promethean vision of human social organization, namely that human beings using knowledge and technical prowess can and should impose their will on the rest of the planet, you know, or what is called nature, for better or worse. The charge is that other living species are mere playthings for the use of human beings. There are humans and there is nature in contradiction. The charge is particularly aimed at Engels, who it is claimed took a bourgeois positivist view of science, namely that scientific knowledge was progressive, always neutral in its ideology, and so was the relationship between man and nature. Indeed, indeed there are many modern green critiques of Marx and Engels that say they're unaware that homo sapiens were destroying the planet and thus themselves. Instead, Marx and Engels had this Promethean faith in capitalism's ability to develop the productive forces and technology and to overcome any risks to the planet and nature. Next. Um, we can see that um, in the next graph, if I can uh, just straighten it out. The Marx and Engels have paid no attention is the criticism to the impact of nature on human social activity. But that idea has been totally bumped by recent excellent scholarship in the groundbreaking work of Marxist authors like John Bellamy Foster and Paul Burkett. And even more recently, Kohei Seto uh, has produced a, a really detailed analysis of Marx's notebooks on the relationship of soil and nature to the, to, and its exhaustion through the degrading impact of capitalism on the planet. To quote Marx, the capitalist mode of production collapsed the population together in great centers and causes the urban population to achieve an ever-growing preponderance. 
It disturbs the metabolic interaction between man and earth. It prevents the return to the soil of its constituent elements consumed by man in the form of food and clothing. Hence, it hinders the operation of the eternal natural condition for the lasting fertility of the soil. Here Marx talks about the degradation of the soil, but also the breakdown between the process of nature's connection with humanity, an intervention, a rift that is developed. This has been now, it would, we can now see that in no way can Marx be described as somebody who just has a complete view of uh, the progressive nature of expansion of technology and production. This is the same with Engels. Engels must be saved from the same charge. Engels was well ahead of Marx, actually, on this. And if you read my little book, you'll see that Engels was well ahead of Marx on many issues to deal with political economy to begin with. And he connected the destruction of damage to, to the environment that capitalist industrialization was causing. At just 18 years old, while still living in his hometown of Barman, now called Wuppertal, he wrote several diary notes about the inequality of the rich and the poor, and the pious hypocrisy of church preachers and also the pollution of uh, rivers. In his book, only at the age of 22, called The Outlines of a Critique of Political Economy, the first criticism of bourgeois political economy from a Marxist point of view, uh, the critique or the outline is called Umrissa. He, I quote just a few things from that. To make earth an object of huckstering, the earth which is our one and all, the first condition of our existence, was the last step towards making oneself an object of huckstering. It was on this, to this very day an immorality surpassed only by the immorality of self-alienation. So the uh, trade and commerce works from the point of view whatever earth is happening to earth. The monopolization of the earth by a few, the exclusion of the rest from that which is a condition of their life, as we know that's the emergence of capitalism and the enclosures, the removal of the peasantry from the land, ordinary people from the land, yields nothing in, in, in immorality to the subsequent huckstering, huckstering of the earth itself. Once the earth becomes commodified by capital, it is subject to just as much degradation as labor. Now, in his really uh, expansive work on the nature of uh, the dialectics of nature, which Marx wrote, uh, sorry, Engels wrote in the late 1870s, completed in 1883, just after Marx's death, but was never published until I think 1927. Uh, this book, and where Engels really deals with the relationship with humanity and nature, is often attacked as being uh, distorting Marx's materialist conception of history as applied to humans. It does, the argument is that Engels could uh, just seize it purely as a process of the expansion of uh, uh, progress of production and technology, and in no way, way relates it to the process of nature, and also suggests that in some way the materialist conception can be applied to nature, uh, and this many people disagree with. But I think Marx could not be clearer on the dialectical relation between humans and nature. The next graph shows these quite a lot of quotes. I won't read them all out, but if you read uh, the dialectics of nature, you find that Engels talks about um, how we should not flatter ourselves on the account of human conquest over nature, because such conquest takes its revenge on us. Each of them is true, has the first place, but there are unforeseen consequences, unforeseen effects from when we human beings act upon nature. People in Mesopotamia, Greece, and so on destroyed the forest, forest to obtain cultivatable land. The result was that they destroyed the soil in doing so. And on the, the Italians did something similar on the Alps, in the pine forests and so on, wi wiping out the ability of mountain springs to provide water for uh, plants, leading to huge flood and torrents. All these things we now know in the 20th and 21st century as a result of the expansion of capitalist production uncontrolled. Um, so just to read that final quote there on this uh, slide, just at every step, we are reminded that we are by no means rule over nature like a conqueror over a foreign people, like someone standing outside nature, but that, the, that we, with flesh, blood and brain, belong to nature and exist in its midst, and that all our mastery of it consists in the fact that we have the advantage over all other beings of being able to know and correctly apply its laws. And in the next graph, uh, this is what Engels goes on to deal with, the question not just of the unforeseen consequences 
of the impact of humanity's activity on nature, but also the social consequences that flow from this breakdown between harmony between uh, human beings and nature through the process of production and the social organization of human uh, humanity. If it's required the labor of a thousand years for us to learn to some extent to calculate the more remote natural consequences of our actions aiming at production, it has been still more difficult in regard to the more remote social consequences of these actions. And in the next graph, Engels goes on to explain some of the things he means here. He points out that when Columbus discovered Af America, he did not know that by doing so, he was leaving, giving new life to slavery, which in Europe had long been done away with on the whole, and laying the basis for a new slave tra traffic in the Americas, which had not, of course, existed before. And in the next one, he talks about how Spanish planters in Cuba, who burned down the forests in the slopes of the mountains and obtained fertilizer, generation of profitable coffee trees, but what cared were they when the tropical rainfall came and washed away the soil, leaving only bare rock. Agricultural degradation followed from the process of slave, uh, slavery and the plantations in the Americas. And in the next graph, he points out that we now know it's not just slavery uh, that Europeans brought to the Americas, but also disease, which in many forms exterminated 90% of the Native Americans and was the main reason for their subjugation by colonialism. The conquistadores had the technology and they had the forces and they divided the populations, but actually uh, it, was the it was disease that destroyed many Native Americans and reduced them to uh, the slave slavery that existed for many uh, decades and centuries afterwards. In many ways, COVID-19 in the 21st century, we now know it was capitalism's drive to industrialize agriculture and usurp the remaining wilderness and has led to nature striking back as humans come into contact now with pathogens to which they have no immunity, just as Native Americans did in the 16th century. In the next graph, we also can see that this process of uh, uh, expansion of capitalism and production without any uh, Social control without any harmony with nature has led to environmental destruction. World Life Federation has pointed out these new diseases that are appearing are going to continue to happen over the next period. 60 to 70 percent of new diseases have emerged in humans since 1990 and they've come from wildlife. We already have significantly altered three quarters of the land and two thirds of oceans, and more than a third of the land and three quarters of freshwater resources are devoted now to crops or livestock. And about 700 vertebrates have gone extinct in the past few centuries. 40% of amphibians and a third of coral species, sharks and marine mammals look set to follow. And more than 80% of the agreed international targets to protect uh, other species on this planet and nature in general will not be met this year. Uh, the, no governments have gone anywhere near achieving that. In the next graph, I want to just point out uh, Engels' view on how this process, the dialectics of nature and humanity, would develop. He says it's through often cruel experience and by collecting and analyzing historical material, we are gradually learning how to get a clear view of the more remote social effects of our productive activity. And so the possibilities afforded us of mastering and controlling these things. With every day that passes, we're learning more to understand these laws more correctly and getting to know more the immediate and the more remote consequences of our interference with the traditional course of nature. But the more this happens, says Engels, the more will men not only feel but also know their unity with nature, and thus more impossible will become the senseless and anti-natural idea of a contradiction between mind and matter, between man and nature, and between soul and body. And in the next graph, I point out what Engels, uh, what Marx said about the process of bringing about more an understanding and the control and management of shared resource resources between humanity and nature itself. Nature takes a long time to bring about changes, and, they, and so hundreds of years take for, for some forests to grow, and yet human beings can wipe them out within weeks and months. That's the process by which we must understand. So we can no longer continue with the process of just expanding capitalist production 
and for the interests of profit in contradiction to agriculture, which has a whole range of things for which we must uh, uh, bring about harmony with. To finish on the last graph, this is a point I think is important because it's, it's, Engels is not just saying science, understanding what is happening is enough. To carry out the control that we require to bring about harmony between nature and humanity means something more than mere knowledge. It requires a complete revolution in our hitherto existing mode of production and with it of our whole contemporary social order. As climate activist Greta Thunberg said, the climate and ecological crisis cannot be solved within today's political and economic systems. That isn't an opinion, that's a fact. Thanks, Ed. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh, so uh, now, so now let's, let's do, do, am I getting an echo? Getting an echo? Oh, sorry about that. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Engels, uh, Urban Political Ecology. Okay, thank you, Sebastian, and thanks to Michael. Um, Michael has talked quite generally about Engels' view on nature and their relevance today. So what I'm going to turn to is some of the more specific points that Engels makes. I kind of turn from the general to the particular. And I'll talk mostly about the condition of the working class in England, written in 1844, and to some extent about the housing question of 1873. So as Michael um, ended his talk with, as well as ecological crises over the past few years, We've also seen the growth of um, sometimes quite impressive mass movements over climate change and related issues such as biodiversity, uh, climate strikes, school student strikes, uh, extinction rebellion, movements of the Canadian First Nations and other indigenous peoples over oil pipelines and you know many other movements around the world taking direct action. And for a lot of the participants in these movements, I would argue radical ideas, the idea that we need system change uh, it's beginning to fit with people's understanding of the problem. Um, and a number of scholars um, have drawn on Marxist ideas to try to kind of intervene in these movements and to kind of draw out some of the specificities of what capitalism is and why it's so problematic. So John Bellamy Foster, Brett Clark, Richard York, and some of the panellists of this conference, um, such as Rob Wallace and Andreas Malm and others, have made productive use of Marx's writings, um, particularly Karl Marx's references to metabolism in Capital, the idea that the labour process is a process of regulating the metabolism between humans and the rest of nature. Um, another tradition, though, that I want to look at, um, where I think Engels is also relevant, is the tradition of urban political ecology. And this is associated primarily with writers within geography, such as Eric Swingerdow, Nick Hainan, Maria Kaika, um, and they have turned their focus towards the natural processes, social and natural processes that constitute the urban environment. So these kind of thinkers have really um, started from David Harvey's comments that there is nothing unnatural about New York City. Nature isn't just something that happens out there in the wilderness, um, you know, in a place where, where um, you know, separate from the urban environment. You know, cities are also where urban and social, where social and natural processes come together. They're networks of social and natural processes. They have looked, they've also drawn on the topic, the um, concept of metabolism, but seen it as a historical process whereby goods brought into cities are qualitatively transformed. Um, you know, so commodities such as food and water are transformed um, as they enter cities in what is both a material and a social process. Urbanisation as well is also seen as an ecological process. So cities and the um, development of cities, um, they're seen as historically specific forms of the human relationship with nature. So it's about historicising our relationship with the natural world. They have recognised that the urban environment is produced, but not produced to everyone's benefit. It's produced in a particular way and to the benefit of the ruling class and to the exclusion of many others. And they've also recognised that cities are often sites of socio-ecological struggles. So struggles over the environment and biodiversity 
also often take place within urban environments, not just in rural areas or wilderness areas. So where does Engels fit into this? Um, some of these thinkers have looked to Engels. So Swingerdow and Heinen point out um, that Engels was writing on these themes in the 19th century, and they've described him as the first to recognise that the environmental conditions of cities were related to the class character of industrial urbanisation. But for others, Engels is seen as not sufficiently dialectical. And uh, Michael has touched on some of these long debates. Um, but if you look at Neil Smith, for example, who's really quite influential in these debates, he says that um, Engels lacks a subject-object dialectic. So he's, he feels that Engels treated nature as something that humans only act on from the outside, that it's just an object for human actions. Um, by contrast, he says that Marx had a more dialectical approach that starts with the unity of humans and nature and looks at the historically specific ways by which they become become separated in, in our sort of um, cultural understanding of what nature is. Uh, so to come on to Engels. So Engels, I think these kind of themes of urban environments and social and ecological struggles taking place within urban environments would have been very familiar to Engels, actually. He was writing at a time when there was migration of people into cities. Um, according to his own estimates, the population of Lancashire increased by 10 times uh, in, in 80, 80 years, up to 1844 when he was writing. He had uh, the um, drawing in of, of commodities into cities, uh, you know, cotton being brought from the Americas in the 1840s uh, in order to, to fuel the cotton mills of places like like Manchester, uh, you had the creation of an industrial working class, but that was also bound up with a transition towards the use of fossil fuels, um, primarily coal in the factories. And uh, as Andreas Malm has uh, explained uh, in his book Fossil Capital, uh, the transition from uh, renewable forms of energy, or what we now call renewable energy, towards uh, fossil fuel and coal was something that was brought about in the interests of the ruling class at the time during the Industrial Revolution. And it was also resisted by workers. Um, you had things like the plug plot riots, or also known as the, the, um, the first general strike, where workers sabotaged the machinery, where they pulled um, the plugs out of steam powered machinery to let all the steam out to stop it working. That was 1842. This is right before Engels arrives in Manchester. So he would have been very much aware of what was happening there. Um, the 19th century ruling class would not have known the effect that the transition to fossil fuels would have on climate change, um, as we as we know now, but they would have been aware of the health impacts for people, particularly workers. And this is what Engels describes repeatedly in the condition of the working class in England. He talks about the foul smell of the coal smoke in the cities. He talks about streets that are rough, dirty, filled with vegetable and animal refuse, without sewers or gutters, but supplies but supplied with foul stagnant pools instead. He talks about water pollution, um, air pollution, of course. He talks about the atmosphere within the factories um, as well. Um, inside the factories, it's at once damp and warm, unusually warmer than is necessary. And when the ventilation is not very good, impure, heavy, deficient in oxygen, filled with dust and the smell of the machine oil, which almost everywhere smears the floor, sinks into it and becomes rancid. So there's really kind of a motive discussions of the ecological conditions that workers were faced with. Um, it talks about workplace injuries as well, the kind of danger that people faced within the workplace as well quite a lot. So, you know, workers were literally finding it difficult to breathe. I can't breathe could have been the slogan of the 19th century working class as much as it's the slogan of people today. Um, you know, with Black Lives Matter, but also with, with the COVID pandemic. It's kind of striking really how contemporary some of his concerns are. I mean, people will remember the flooding in Jakarta earlier this year, I'm sure, or they might have seen reports of the air pollution problem in Delhi or flooding in um, in Pakistan just uh, recently. Um, you know, the descriptions of people having to bail uh, disgusting water out of their flooded homes is um, pretty much what Engels was describing back in the 19th century in places like London and Manchester. Uh, viewers might 
know that Engels followed the working class movement of his time in arguing that those who profit from exposing workers to such conditions commit social murder. They create an environment in which people cannot hope to live healthy lives. Um, social murder is kind of not the kind of violence of someone coming up to you in the street and, and beating you up or stabbing you, but it's, necess it's still a form of violence uh, that people are committing by not allowing workers to, to survive. Uh, I guess we're all kind of thinking about public health and pandemics. At the moment, he had a lot to say about that. He described how relations produced by human activity created an ecological niche in which harmful pathogens would thrive. And he talked about the most terrifying disease outbreaks of his time, which were caused things like cholera and typhus and typhoid fever. Um, so Engels was participating in a key debate of his time around public health. Um, so he talked about how the, um, you know, when the, the cholera epidemic um, hit, then it really made the the bourgeois class quite terrified because they, you know, they don't seem to have been too bothered when working class people got cholera, but when it looked like it might spread beyond those parts of the city and start to affect the uh, more genteel areas of cities, and they started to get really worried about this pandemic. Um, he wouldn't. He wasn't familiar with the um, the germ theory of disease. And John Bellamy Foster's written a big book um, called The Return of Nature, where he talks about this, how Engels was actually intervening and communicating with some of the people that were discussing public health at the time. So you didn't really have the germ theory until 1854 with John Snow and his identification of contaminated water at the Broad Street water pump um, as a source of one of the big cholera outbreaks. So some of Engels's writings on this in the 1840s reflect a bit the kind of miasma theory of disease, the idea that unhealthy air in itself was causing some of these diseases. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's still kind of relevant and still very much ahead of his time um, because you know, he recognises that it's living conditions that affect who is most susceptible to infection and most vulnerable to these kinds of diseases. Um, in the early 20th century, you got in, in public health, there was kind of a turn towards the idea that health is something that's the individual's responsibility, that it's an individual state of attainment that we should all try and achieve good health as individuals. Um, it's only sort of in the later 20th century when you started to get sociologists of health, some of them influenced by Marxism, started to look towards the social and economic causes of ill health and start to... Um, start to question what are the causes of the causes of ill health that you started to get a more more holistic understanding of um of public health and what the causes of it are so Engels was about 100 years ahead of his time in that and that he was already thinking of it in those terms back in the 1840s you start to get people talking about structural violence in the late 20th century social structures that make it impossible for people to meet their needs um but this is anticipated by the the 24 year old Engels, I would argue. Um, to come back to sort of political ecology, um, I think political ecologists recognise that cities are the sites at which large scale socioeconomic processes are experienced as everyday reality by ordinary people. Urbanisation and these big kind of processes sometimes operating at a global scale and can make themselves felt at even at the bodily scale. They can Things like polluted waterways and polluted air can get under our skin and make themselves felt. So the uh, Marxist biologists, Richard Levins and Richard Lewontin, said that it's not ridiculous to talk about a proletarian lung or the pancreas under capitalism, that capitalism affects our health at even at a bodily scale, that our class position is felt at that scale. And um, this is quite a kind of geographical way of thinking, I would argue. It, you know, actually, contrary to what Neil Smith seem to think um, this evades the Cartesian distinction between what happens at the scale of human society and the natural environment. Um, this you know, isn't the thought of someone that treats as a dualist who treats nature just as something that one observes from the outside. It's an integrative and dialectical approach to society and nature, I would argue. Um, I might skip over the housing question I think so we could have a more of a discussion. But I think just to 
briefly touch on it. The, he comes back to some of the same issues in the housing question around water, water pollution, pandemics, epidemics and things. He also engages in a kind of polemical argument around the solutions to some of these problems. Um, he's arguing against people, um, what he calls prudonists and people like Emil Sachs, this kind of social reformer, who want workers to become small capitalists in order to solve some of the housing problems. Uh, and Engels says, no, like we don't want to just um, become capitalists and own our own homes and um, take action against the housing problem by by amassing more and more commodities. What we need is social revolution, which would take housing out of the commodity circuit and turn housing uh, into a public good. And I think there are parallels to some extent with how we might see environmentalism today. Uh, bourgeois environmentalists and you know what, what you might call lifestyle environmentalists want to act by uh, appealing to people as consumers. They want people to consume differently or consume less um, and reduce their, their ecological footprint. Whereas Engels turns, leads in the opposite direction. He leads towards a strategy which is more like decommodification, turning things into a public good that is available to people for free, extricating things people need from the market. Um, I'm drawing here on um, Matt Huber's article in uh, in Catalyst that he spoke about at HM last year and published in Catalyst. So um, have a look at that um, uh, yeah, climate action for the working class, whatever it's called. Uh, or we could discuss it more in the discussion. Um, but what I want to say, end on is I think that neither the condition of the working class in England or the housing question are particularly influenced by, by Marx. Um, the condition obviously predates their kind of joint philosophical works. It predates the time when they started to work together. The housing question written much later in the 1870s does refer to capital. And he would have been discussing that with Marx, I would say. But I think it still reflects some of Engels' distinctive contributions and his distinctive thought. So I think that Engels makes a contribution to ecological thinking that is aligned with Marx's views. I agree with Michael on that. But I also think it offers something distinctive as well as something additional to what Marx said um, with the kind of concept of metabolism. Um, I think we live in a time when we have increased levels of urbanisation. We live in a very urban world and where social movements are often urban and um, cities offer the promise of emancipation. And I think, you know, Engels didn't say go back to the rural areas, did he? Yeah, you know, he looked towards cities. He lived in cities himself for most of his life. Um, but although you know cities have that kind of emancipatory potential, they also involve marginalisation and exclusion and exploitation and oppression of people. Um, I think that cities are so we should be interested in what happens in cities, but we shouldn't theorise what happens in cities in a in an anthropocentric manner. That we shouldn't downplay the relationship between processes of urbanisation. Um, and changes in, in the natural environment. Um, so I will end on that point. Thanks, Camilla. Um, can you hear me? No feedback or echo? Great. Um, okay, so while we, um, while we wait for some questions to come in, um, I had a couple of my own. Uh, firstly, Camilla, so on the last point about cities and their role in um, Engels and Marx's conception, of course, one of the um, sort of classic phrases <coughs> about uh, cities is uh, this notion of overcoming the division between town and country, um, which I've always found an attractive idea. Um, but uh, I was wondering how you feel about it today, uh, what it would mean concretely, especially since, um, you know, it seems to be the case that uh, the uh, coronavirus has its roots in the precisely the blurring of the divisions between uh, forests and uh, populated areas. Uh, the abolition of the kind of grey zone between um, forests populated by wildlife and uh, areas populated by human beings. Um, so what would 
the idea of overcoming the division between country and city, country and town mean concretely for a 21st century socialist program? And how do we tie that to the kind of transitional or you know, radical reformist demands about Green New Deal and so on, or Green Industrial Revolution or eco-socialist transition? What does it mean? Does it mean just planting more trees in the cities and having public transport in the countryside areas? That certainly would address some of the issues that the Gilets Jaunes uh, movement raised in France about the way public services in the rural areas were neglected and you know, the way the train way, the tr railway lines for unprofitable places were closed down and so on. But uh, maybe it means more than that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, and for Michael, my question really is, um, I mean, that clearly you're right that the debate has moved on quite substantially since the kind of 1960s, 1970s types of criticisms of Engels as simply a positivist and uh, dialectics of nature being a kind of crude uh, pre-premonition uh, or uh, presentiment of what uh, stance um, would become in its own conception of philosophy of nature uh, and the work of uh, many of these Marxist eco-Marxists has been very important for that. Um, but how would you relate what Marx, uh, what Engels writes in Dialectics of Nature to the rest of his work? I mean, is it is the aspect of the Dialectics of Nature something that we can argue about, but we can take it or leave it? Um, you know, we could say it's useful for understanding ecology today, or we could say it's you know only very partially useful because it's it's handicapped by um, certain scientific notions which have become outdated. But you know. Angles on politic, political strategy, angles on war, angles on uh, political economy, angles on history, and so on. We can take all of that. Or is there a tighter connection between what Engels says about nature and philosophy of nature and the other innovative aspects of his um, of his work? It's clear that, for example, Engels has a more uh, not exactly catastrophist, but more kind of pessimistic view of the possible um, uh, outcomes of human history. I mean, for example, his writings on the on war seem to be very uh, clear about uh, the impending disaster of the First World War, the mass slaughter, and so on. Um, so, is there is there kind of like a negative? more pessimistic, more, uh, more clear-eyed, maybe, vision from Engels that infuses the rest of his thought that's quite visible also in his, his, his close relationship to studying nature compared to Marx, for example, perhaps is more, more abstract, more philosophical. I don't know. I mean, that's the question. What, what is the relationship between, between his thought as a whole? So we have a few other questions that have come in. Um, from Baruch Jimenez for Camilla. Uh, why do you think Engels expressed a strong concern for environmental and public health issues? And uh, Steve Davies, uh, following up on my question, says, uh, did Engels make a distinction between rural but cultivated and populated areas and, for want of a better world, wilderness? even if sparsely populated, for example, the Amazon, was the notion of wilderness something that Engels took seriously? I suppose then another question would be um, the other work for which Engels is very uh, well known, obviously, is Origin of Family Private Property in the State, um, which, of course, in the first part on pre-class societies, um, depends on a certain conception of how humans related to nature and lived off nature. Um, maybe you would like to say something about that, Michael, how, how his conception of dialectics of nature relates to what he said about origins of family, private property in the state. Maybe deal with those first and then see if other questions come in. 
Well, uh, just on your question seven, also on Steve's, as you say, flows from what you said. I think um, if you want to make a distinction between how Ingalls approaches this and Marx, I think it's, in my view, it's difficult. But if you do want to make a distinction, the distinction is on the fact that Engels had direct experience of what was happening to the working class in the most important industrial capitalist economy at the time they moved into England, both Marx and Engels. And Engels was in uh, Manchester well before Marx because his father and his family, the Engels uh, family, owned cotton mills both in Germany and in Manchester, and Engels was taken and employed by his father in the cotton mill in near in Salford, Manchester, uh, so that he was going to be pumped part of the business, as it were. And Engels conducted, on the one hand, in, during the day, the operations of basically a senior manager uh, taking a share of the profits out of the company, which was employing workers in the cotton mill. And in the evenings, he was going into working class areas with his girlfriend to experience what was really happening uh, to the huge influx of people that were coming in from the countryside, as Camilla has said, to work in these machine-based mills. And so I get, a I get a feeling from the view which Engels had of a combination between the experience of workers, the rottenness of the conditions, the creation of all the pollution, and the, staff, and the lack of proper food, lack of proper housing, all those aspects, the social issues which flow from that, and also the power of science that was coming from the process of the expansion of capitalism and machinery and so on. And he saw these two things in great contradiction. So while Engels sometimes emphasizes the fact that Marxism is really a scientific socialism by meaning than that we need to understand the actual processes of capitalism, and its contradictions in order to understand how it, we can progress and change that to a socialist organization based on common ownership, democracy, and the, the common use, not only of, uh, of natural resources, but also the common organization of that, both humanity and nature. You get that combination between the experience that he had in industrial Britain and England in the uh, 1840s, and the his his general development of understanding the science of uh, society and in particular nature. So I think that's how you get those two things together. And it seems relates to Seb's question about war and imperialism because um, I urge uh, everybody who doesn't know to read what Engels says on the development of imperialism in particular in anti-during, but in often later in his later works after Marx's death and his prediction of the world war that was going to come and did come in the early part of the 20th century. Not only is it so prescient, but also he raises the point about the relationship between, again, uh, the tremendous development of technical progress, which you want, but also the contradictions that arise under capitalism, the social organization of that, which that technical progress is used to make war, uh, that technical progress is used to exploit labor around the world in the colonies and also to exploit nature. So you get that key contradiction. Uh, so far from being a positivist and saying that he's just interested in the progress of science and innovation as a result of the machine age, uh, he was also, he was above all uh, an historical materialist. He recognized the contradictions between those two. Uh, if you think that's different from the way Marx approaches it, then perhaps you can discuss, but I'm not sure that it is. Thanks, Camilla. You're muted. You're muted, Camilla. Not again. Still muted. <laughs> Melo, you're still muted. 
can speak, Camilla? One, two, three. No, can't hear you. Your mic symbol is definitely not on mute. Want me to take up another question, Sid, while we're waiting? Yes. We have some questions. So, yeah. uh, well, um, I'll kind of try to fix that. Uh, so, yeah. we have a question from um, Philip Mesco. Uh, you talked about how the dialectics of nature is often misread, but do you see in its significant evolution, if not a cut, in Engels's approach between the 1840s and the 1870s, 1880s? And we also have a question from Volkan Sankanya, Sakaria. Uh, is the economic crisis intensified by the environmental negative externalities um, in terms of lowering the rate of profit more? Um, also a question uh, from George. Uh, who says, what do you think the relationship between ecology and Marx, Engels and Marx's vision of communism's alternative is? Did ecology play a significant part in that vision at all? And then finally, Giorgio Cesarale to both Michael and Camilla. Uh, has contemporary ecology theory developed a reflection on the laws of dialectics formulated by Engels, which are also the laws of the relation between humanity and nature? Camilla, are you, are you back? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, can you hear me? Do you want to respond? Uh, yeah, I guess on, sorry about that, on some of the questions around cities, because I think this idea of overcoming the distinction between city and countryside is a really interesting one um, because you know Engels he goes on and on about how terrible cities are doesn't he and yet he still says that it's you know absolutely necessary that people it's a necessary historical process of development that in order to create the modern revolutionary class of the proletariat it's necessary to cut the umbilical cord which still bind the work with the past to the land so he doesn't want people to go back to the um, to the rural existence in the countryside I think the kind of early kind of logical way to understand it is that this kind of relation, this kind of ending of the abolition of um, town and countryside uh, is something that can only really happen post revolution, you know, after you've had this kind of um, intensification of the contradiction between town and countryside, um, you kind of get, you get a revolution because the working class have been brought in together in this way and then afterwards you can try and um, end the distinction between the two. I mean that sounds a little bit deterministic but that seems to be what Engels is arguing about. Um, John Bellamy Foster talks quite a lot about this uh, in his book again um, through William Morris and his kind of ideas about what a future society might look like. Um, but I think the kind of coronavirus thing does pose a challenge to those of us who have been saying that nature isn't just the wilderness because as you say it does seem to suggest that maybe we should turn our focus back towards um, preserving wild places and just letting the sort of bats get on with it and leaving them alone and not encroaching yes. on their habitat too much. Um, so I think you know the, the virus does have its roots in encroachment into forest areas that is True. Um, I don't think you can understand it as just simply let's scale back our impact on on wilderness and, and nature, though. I think I think that's kind of why the political ecology approach is quite appealing, because it recognises that it's a part of human life that we're always going to relate to the natural environment. I mean, we're always going to have agriculture of some kind, evidently. Um, but what kind of agriculture are we going to have? Are we going to have monocultures, uh, we're going to have you know, land grabs in Africa that, um, that kick people off the land and install these massive um, plantations of, um, of palm oil or, or whatever that is so problematic. Um, not necessarily, you could, 
picture a different kind of, of agriculture. I think by looking at the, the specifically capitalist nature of agriculture that we have rather than just, you know, going back to, to wilderness and things. Um, how to tie that to things like the Green New Deal. Um, yeah, I mean, it's difficult to know, isn't it, what's going to happen to Green New Deal type demands at the moment. I think it should certainly be part of what we talk about when we're talking about recovery from from this pandemic, um, particularly in in Britain and, you know, and elsewhere. We've been trying to link the idea that we want investment in climate jobs. Uh, yeah, I think um, free public transport is, is an excellent demand. Um, I'm not sure that specifically how that relates to the, um, the abolition of town and country and if I haven't followed the, the yellow vests in France as much but this is certainly what people are pushing for in, um, in, in Glasgow and that's going to be part of what people are campaigning for in the run up to COP26 when it ever happens next year. I think that is something that could unite people um, in different parts of rural and um, urban areas. Uh, Steve D raises a very good question about does Engels distinguish between rural and wilderness and um, yeah I don't, I don't really know the answer to that but I think it's a very good question I kind of conflated them a bit I realise. Um, Baruch uh, Jimenez uh, says why was Engels so interested in public health and I my understanding is that this is, was was one of the key demands of the workers movement at the time that I don't think he came up with the idea of social murder just out of thin air I think this was something that was being raised by workers at the time um, notably the chartists um, and the chartists were not just a movement for uh, better you know, access to um, you know for the vote for for men um, although that certainly was a key demand I think it was about working class representation you know they had these big strikes and movements and newspapers and things that Engels was very much um, involved in and and aware of. So I think um, public health was a key issue for workers at the time. I mean, the, the match girls or match women strike was a little bit later than that, um, of course, sort of at the en end of Engels' life. But it's also about workplace safety in a way, because people were getting these kind of horrible diseases from, from making matches uh, that kind of affected their teeth and, and things. Um, yeah, the origin of the family, and I'll sort of end on this. I think I think it's right that to mention it, and it does uh, depend on a conception of humans' relationship to nature. I think that's right. Uh, if you look at the the part played by Labour in the transition from ape to man, which is the most useful and coherent section of the dialectics of nature, as far as I'm concerned, it does quite clearly talk about how human labour has changed the natural environment and how that natural environment has then uh, acted back on human societies and shaped human societies and human relationships between each other. And um, I think this is kind of foundational to what he talks about uh, in The Origin of the Family just a, a few years later, how um, you, know, you had climatic changes back in sort of 12,000 years ago, the start of the Holocene, uh, which changed human societies and then human societies changed the natural environment around them. And I think that's that's a starting point for understanding how you started to get settled societies, settled agriculture, people not being nomadic hunter gatherers, but staying in the same place, growing crops or starting to. Uh, and then this then in turn affects how people relate to each other with a group of people uh, gathering a surplus to themselves becoming uh, kind of nascent ruling class and you start to get different, you start to get the, the, the origin of the family, you start to get different relationships between between men and, and women. Um, it doesn't happen overnight, but you get the beginnings of that. So, um, yeah, I think it's right to point to the relationship between society and nature in that kind of volume. Thanks. Um, there are some more questions for you in a minute, uh, Camilla. Um, Michael, do you want to respond to some of the ones that you've got? Yeah, I've got the, the question of, I think I forget the, who has said it, but apologies for that, but um, it was said, does Engels have a different view 
about uh, the social question of society in the 1880s as compared to in the 1840s when he wrote uh, The Condition of the Working Class in England and uh, had also written the outline of a, of a critique of the political economy. He's a very young man. And then when we get to the 1880s, he writes uh, anti juring and we just said about the dialectics of nature too, uh, was finished more or less in the early 1880s. And Marx died in 1883. Uh, so is there a change in the way Engels looked at all these questions? And can we talk about a cutoff? Well, I think the big cutoff there between the 1840s and the 1880s is uh, Marx taking up the issues of political economy. Engels had urged him to do so uh, when they first met early on in the 1840s before they were both exiled. Well, at least Marx was exiled uh, to England and Engels ended up coming back to Manchester to work. So from the period of 1850 until 1870, when Engels retired and moved back to London and uh, up until 1883, when Marx died, you could say that Engels had a sort of impasse on developing any major theoretical works. He helped Marx not only financially, but also theoretically and uh, journalistically, but he didn't do much of his own work and make much public uh, publication of that work except for journalistic articles. But after, when he returned to London then he and retired from work in Manchester, then he began to do, develop his theoretical works. And, uh, Camilla has mentioned some of them. In my view, they are much more, uh, in the condition of the working class in England, I rec recommend everybody to read on the Marx's archive or anyway, because it's such a, a great book, a searing indictment of uh, the industrial capitalism. But his works in the 1870s and 1880s, including the dialectics of nature, uh, also make significant contributions to our understanding of historical materialism, the nature of capitalism, and uh, and the trends that are taking place in it. And the anti juring deals with the arguments presented by people, social reformers and others who think that things can be achieved by change without changing the capitalist process. And he, he expands also on the nature of the capitalist process. On the housing question, for example, just let me quote you what he said um, in the housing question uh, in, that, in those series of articles. He said, it's not the, the solution of the housing question doesn't simultaneously solve the social question, but the solution of the social questions, that is by the abolition of the capitalist mode of production, is the solution to the housing question. Yes, you can uh, prove, improve housing, you can build more housing, but we won't be able to do it properly. Uh, is the housing shortage is no accident. It's a necessary institution and can only be abolished together with all its effects on health. I'm quoting Engels here. Only if the whole social order from which it springs is fundamentally refashioned. So he's making the point that the horrible social conditions that existed in the 1840s that he saw before, which of course continue and still continue now, uh, can't be resolved by piecemeal measures uh, in terms of uh, the process. Even the Green New Deal, which as somebody has mentioned, will not succeed unless we also have a social transformation of the mode of production to make it possible for public investment to dominate in the directions of the social economy. Uh, I'll finish on this point, said that uh, it's raised about the, uh, what does, uh, is there an ecological aspect or uh, area for under communism? How will, will communism, will we get rid of the capitalist production? To, does communism encompass an ecological harmony with man and nature? Well, I think it can. And that depends on common ownership. It depends on the common re use of resources. And it depends on us understanding how to develop a social economy. There's a big debate at the moment uh, between, if you like, those who claim that we still need to grow because there's poverty around the world. We still need to expand GDP production and so on. We don't have full employment. In this COVID pandemic, we're going to have hundreds of millions unemployed and in poverty again. And those who say, Expansion of, of growth is a is a bad step forward because it's it's creating inequalities, it's destroying uh, the planet, it's creating environmental pollution. We need degrowth. We need to reduce growth, uh, uh, and that's the way that we have to go forward. I see the answer from the Marx and Engels perspective, from a Marxist perspective, we need a social economy. We need to use the resources and expand them, but in the direction which overcomes 
the social inequalities and also the contradiction, the metabolic rift, if you like, between nature and humanity. And that is possible on the basis of common ownership and a planned economy and the over removal of the capitalist mode of production. That's Engels key points that he makes in the 1880s, both in the dialectics and anti during and his other work. Um, also, the profit rate, you forgot, it's very surprising. Oh, okay, the profit not. rate. Yeah, I've slipped up on the profit rate. That's not, it's a bit of a blind spot for me, I said the uh, profit rate. Um, but it, Comra raises the question, will this uh, add to the downward tendency of the rate of profit, as, as I understand your question, the ecological? Well, if we remain on a capitalist mode of production or to expand uh, methods by which we introduce renewables, why we uh, do away, we build more infrastructure in order to cope with uh, the problems of flooding and so on. But we don't really resolve anything to do with industrial, industrial farming and so on, because as uh, Camilla said, it's not just the fact that wildlife are distributing pathogens, it's the industrial farm process that is involved. The Danish case is a clear example of how industrial farming or farming for profit through private ownership has led to the further renewal of uh, these uh, pan of these uh, viruses into humanity as a result. So it, we have to change the social basis of the economy. Now, uh, if we go ahead, we're trying to control uh, global warming and to reduce uh, environmental destruction purely on the, on the basis of the capitalist mode of production and private investment, then that is going to bring about a lower rate of profit over time because it means the expansion of machinery, it means the expansion of uh, technology relative to labor. And that is why it's not going to happen because as far as uh, capital is concerned, uh, something that lowers the rate of profit, or lowers the profitability across the board for capitalist expansion will not take place. Uh, and if it has to take place, it will take place in the, in the, in the process of a boom and a slump and, and, a, and a crisis. So yes, uh, the climate change solution and the solution for environmental destruction that cannot come from the expansion of capitalist production because it does not only add to that, but it also increases the contradiction between uh, the key contradiction to capitalism, in my view, between profitability for capital and the need to meet and the social needs of humanity and for that matter, uh, the preservation of nature's harmony with humanity. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, so some more questions have come in. Um, Camilla, I think this is for you. Um, is, is not urbanization an inevitable consequence of capitalism? If it is, then the critique of capitalism for environmental destruction requires a critique of urbanization as also being responsible for environmental destruction. Um, that's one. Um, from Alec Roth, that was from Pritam Singh, by the way. Um, Alec Roth says, did Engels expand on his vision for turning housing into public good? How did he imagine people would collectively manage housing? Um, question for Camilla uh, from Philip Mesco. Wouldn't you say that the countryside today is thoroughly urbanized already? Um, and then there was the question from uh, Giorgio Cesarale to both of you. So, uh, Camilla, you might want to respond. Has contemporary eco ecological theory developed a reflection on the laws of dialectics formulated by Engels, which are also the laws of the evolution between humanity and nature? Sounds like one for Camilla to start with anyway. <laughs> I'm not sure I know the answers to these. Again, your mute, Camilla. You mute again. Oh, yeah. 
You better do what you did before, come out and come back in. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Michael, somebody sent a comment. Uh, yeah. Somebody got the degrowth is super dodgy. The global north can't tell the global south to degrow. Do you want me to have a go at that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with that general sentiment. It's a uh, the degrowth uh, argument has a powerful, powerful point to it, which is that. There is so much waste under capitalist production. There is so much uh, destructive forms of production, armaments, uh, fossil fuel production, uh, the industrial farming we've just been talking about. Uh, and there is, you could argue, uh, a level of over and wasteful consumption in the so-called advanced capitalist economies, at least amongst the rich. Why the what sort of a world is it where billionaires go around in private jets uh, and yachts and all the rest of it? What's, do we need these as a society, these uh, commodities, which are obviously dominated by the consumption of, of big capital and the billionaires, but also lots of things that we had. Do we need 56 different versions of lipstick or uh, detergent or whatever? Uh, uh, these arguments are powerful and they are they're, they are. The solution, according to the decrease theories, is that we need to reduce production. Uh, and in this way, we will save the planet and also reduce waste and, and so on. But it, it doesn't deal with the social structures existing at the moment, in my view, sufficiently in order to be uh, a, a way of considering and analysing the situation. As the question says, first of all, that doesn't really resolve the issue for the so-called global south, where we still have... Uh, something close to 4 billion people below the uh, poverty line, even the official poverty line of World Bank, where even in the global north we have raging inequality where people are still struggling, uh, particularly in regular and recurring slumps of crisis. It seems to me that, uh, well, many, some degrowth theorists will argue, yes, well, we need to get rid of capitalism in order to bring about a reduction, but they put the question of reducing GDP as the one issue, well, I would say let us deal with the social structure of the economy and then we can begin to reorganize what we you do with our resources and where the production goes. I prefer rather than degrowth, the move from a capitalist growth model to one of a social economy which meets social needs. And that will include removing things that we don't need in order to provide the resources in a more harmonious way for things that we do need. Take the housing question. Do we need uh, millions or hundreds of thousands of uh, units in the big cities in the middle, uh, little boxes being built uh, with no possibility of ordinary people being able to, to live in them anyway, either from rental or from buying? Or do we need a program where all those resources of construction and materials involved are used in a harmonious way to provide housing for all uh, through the process of, of a public corporations and public ownership and democratic control by the occupiers of those houses. What We need to reorganize urban planning, to talk about urbanization, uh, in such a way that it meets social need rather than the profits of landlords and developers, which is the way housing works at the moment. And as as uh, Engels said in, the, in his issues, in his articles on the housing question. Uh, I think yeah. so. I think maybe it's a connection thing. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so Pratap Singh asks if um, urbanisation is the problem. Is urbanisation an inevitable consequence of capitalism, and is it therefore something we need to sort of do away with? Um, I'm going to have to disagree there with that I mean I mean partly for personal reasons I quite like cities um lived in London for the past 15 years pretty much and I think you, you know you meet a lot more more people and in some ways have a better quality of life in cities uh, more chance of getting a job um in this day and age um but I think it's I think their relationship with capitalism is not that simple I mean cities have existed um, before 
capitalism existed clearly and I don't think they're necessarily the problem in themselves um Michael has already talked about this but you could have cities with much more sustainable public transport much more um socially run and sustainable housing and you know in many ways those would be more sustainable than people living out in the countryside and traveling long distances to go to work or to to meet other people so I don't think the problem is cities um, in themselves and, you know, going back to the kind of ideas around nature and things, I don't think that cities are just a space where you're detached from nature. I think the commodity form um, kind of obscures the relationship, the social and natural conditions of the things that we produce and consume and trade um, between us in cities but I don't think it's the city in itself that's that's the problem. Um, Alex asks about um, Engels did he expand on his vision of housing as a public good? Um, again Michael's talked a lot about what housing could be. Um, Engels is if you read the housing question it's pretty kind of polemical really it's kind of saying what isn't the solution more than it is saying what is the solution. Um, but I think he's right to sort of talk about the need for, for social revolution rather than kind of let's keep um, <laughs> the same kind of society that we live in already and just reform it by people owning their own ha- homes. Um, it kind of uh, touches on sort of social reproduction as well. Um, without He doesn't sort of put it in those terms, but he talks about how um, in I think Germany there was a specific example of how people were given their own plot of land and their own little home and they could therefore grow some of their own food and things but that um, so it pushed some of the kind of responsibility for what we now might call social reproduction onto the the workers themselves and but that just drove down everyone's wages including the people who didn't have their own home and a plot of land so that's one of the criticisms he makes it still might have some kind of contemporary resonance. Um, uh, has the countryside become thoroughly urbanised? Uh, um, certainly what happens in cities is not easily separable from what happens in the countryside. Um, you, I guess, yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting question. I need to think about that more um there are people who talk about planetary urban urbanization like um andy merrifield he sort of imagines what the world would look like if there was nothing but uh nothing but cities the whole world just covered in yeah. in cities and it's a little bit kind of um tenuous but i think what he's getting at is that there's you can't separate out what happens in cities from what happens in the countryside that there's the commodity form and the drawing bringing in of commodities from the countryside to the cities means that you can't draw a kind of neat distinction between which is which. Um, so there has to be some difference between what we call urban and what we call rural, though, I guess. Otherwise, the whole kind of argument doesn't make any kind of sense because you're not, you know, it's a dialectical relationship, isn't it, really? Um, a unity, but also a distinction between the two. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, if, you're, if what you're saying is that... that the countryside has got industrial agriculture and um, a destruction of uh, wildlife species and, and that's related to what happens in cities and certainly. And there was a question about ecological theory and has it developed in a way that reflects the laws of dialectics? Um, I wrote a whole kind of PhD thesis on dialectics and biology and its um, influence on environmental debates today. It's, I think, the yeah, the dialectical kind of tradition in biology and in ecology as a type of biology, I guess, uh, is kind of, um, it's pretty marginal, really. There's people like um, Levins and Lewontin, who I mentioned before, who have explicitly called themselves dialectical biologists, and I'd recommend their books um, if people want to read those, and a few people who follow them. Um, they're not that influential um there aren't that many people that explicitly say we're doing dialectical biology but I think their ideas do carry some weight uh, especially if you think about this idea of the Anthropocene and the idea 
of kind of um, non-human species, animals and plants being actants and actually influencing the world around them and you know modifying their own their own niches, their own external environments, and then that in turn influences evolution of species. I think that is an idea that is still kind of um, to some extent marginal, but I think it's getting more prominence and is very relevant in how we think about how we relate to other species uh, on the planet at the moment. And you know that kind of goes back to dialectics, um, goes back to kind of uh, um, people um, you know, constructing the world, but not under conditions of their own choosing or, or whatever, although those scientists that, that use those ideas wouldn't explicitly call themselves dialectics. So I think it's, it's there, but it's not explicit. Uh. Thanks. Um, just as a little plug to Historical Materialism, a journal that you may or may not be aware of, uh, but which you should definitely subscribe to uh, now that we have the 25% discount offer. Uh, two articles I would recommend to you in relation to this discussion very highly. One is a piece by Paul Burkett on um, Lukash and the dialectics of nature um, in the light of um, <coughs> the posthumously published um, response to critics, uh, Taylorism, um, uh, the Taylorism book uh, published by Verso, uh, Defense of History and Class Consciousness, uh, Taylorism and the Dialectic. So that's a piece by Paul Burkett, and there's also a very interesting review article uh, which you may find interesting, Camilla, by uh, Emmanuel Barrault of a number of books in French on the uh, dialectics of nature, particularly um, those edited by um, the late Lucien Sèvres, who died, um, who died uh, earlier on this year, um, and also uh, uh, Bitsakis, uh, a Greek uh, Marxist uh, philosopher. Uh, you'll like this one, Michael, um, <laughs> from Christian Fuchs. Ah, oh, Christian, yeah. The new reading of Marx people, the Neue Marx Lektur people, Backhaus Heinrich et al, argue that Engels imposed a mechanistic understanding of the dialectic of nature onto capitalism in his edition of Capital, Volume 3, and turned it into a breakdown theory in respect to the tendency of the profit rate to fall. How does Michael assess such false claims about Engels put forward by the new reading of Marx group? Then a, letter, uh, a question from Mike Breen, who says, why has Engels been attacked by some Marxists for supposedly distorting Marx's work and misrepresenting him? And Pritam Singh comes back with the second question. Uh, can capitalism be considered a superior mode of production to pre-capitalist modes of production from an environmental point of view? Michael, you want to go first? Yeah, well, um, Christian Fuchs raises an uh, important debate that has been going on about uh, Engels' contribution towards political economy. I deal with this in this book I've just produced, a whole chapter on this question of um, whether Engels distorted Marx's view on the law of the tendency of rate of profit to fall, uh, and therefore on the theory of crisis, as Christian has pointed out. The view of the new reading uh, Marxists, these are a group who have restudied uh, Marx's writings in their source in order to see if, if they have been correctly interpreted and whether we can therefore draw conclusions about what Marxist economic theory really is, uh, among other things, uh, when we look at the actual writings that Marx had. One of the criticisms, uh, one of the two points that usually come out of this, at least as far as the rate of profit is concerned in the theory of crisis, first of all, that Engels uh, distorted the Marxist writings on the rate of profit in volume three of Capital, which Engels spent a lot of time on editing and getting published. And there are three chapters there on the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. And the argument of the new reading group is that Engels distorted this to the point uh, where it appears that uh, we have a theory where capitalism is inevitably going to break down when that wasn't uh, Marx's position. Uh, and the second one is that anyway, um, Marx probably didn't uh, really support 
the law of the tenancy rate for, for anymore. He dropped the idea, never wrote about it in the 1870s, and therefore Engels really shouldn't have put any of these notes in volume three of Capital at all. Um, I don't agree with either of those interpretations. I've dealt with that in this book, and there are a number of other uh, writers. I recommend Stavros Mavrodias, who deals with this issue only this year on the question of the role of the new reading school and what they've said about this. Uh, the gist of it is that the argument is that because Engels reorganized some of the words in uh, and some of the chapters and paragraphs in those three chapters uh, that were converted from Marx's notes and writings on the rate of profit, that therefore he changed the view. But I think anybody who just goes and reads those three chapters can see quite clearly that uh, there is a uh, law of profit, tendency of the rate of profit to fall, which leads to crises under capitalism, and that that is what Marx intended. Uh, other people who have studied uh, Engels' editing find that in some ways, Engels' uh, changing of positions of certain paragraphs and so on, and, and the order of the chapters, actually weaken the strengthening, the strong argument that Marx makes about how the relationship between the law of profitability and crises under capitalism, not uh, turning it into some sort of crude breakdown theory. Uh, but on the contrary, some uh, uh, readers argue that he's at Engels weak in the position. Personally, I think Engels done a very good job on editing it, given that it was a bunch of hieroglyphic notes, and he's put it together. There are so many more debates on this, uh, not only the question of whether the law of profit is relevant to crises, as I say, the new reading school says it's not, uh, but also that Marx doesn't really have a theory of crises and you can't get it out of anything in volumes two and three or theories of surplus value. Uh, and we can't discuss that now. It's not on this, on this session. But again, I don't agree with that point of view at all. Um, have I covered everything there, Seb, or have I missed something else? Um, Why has Engels been attacked by some Marxists for supposedly yeah. destroying Marx's work? Well, I think one of the reasons that Engels is attacked for being a positivist, or not having, a, not really being a proper Marxist or, a, or distorting Marxism, is twofold. First, people, uh, I think the key reason is that there seem to be a view amongst uh, the writers of uh, the, the theorists of the uh, Soviet state, particularly the Stalinist state, that Engels in some way. Uh, had presented us with an argument of, for scientific socialism, an inevitable process of going from capitalism to socialism, and that uh, the Stalinist state or the Soviet state represented that process, going from capitalism to socialism, it was progressively going in that direction, and that they used Engels' arguments of scientific socialism to support that. Of course, obviously, from what we've seen with the situation of the experience of uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, a lot of Western-based Marxists have said we need to revise this view. We need to recognize that what was being put forward by the Soviet uh, theorists was wrong. There is no uh, inevitable movement towards, from capitalism towards socialism, and that Engels has created this idea. And therefore, if we go, we need to recognize that Engels has distorted what Marx said, which, as Camilla said, was that Men make their own history, of course, within the, the conditions that are before them, but men make their own history. There is no guarantee that we will go historically towards from capitalism to socialism. There's every possibility that you could go backwards into some form of barbarism and that where, where humanity actually goes backwards. The question of whether it's been going forwards under capitalism is the other question. We can deal with that uh, separately. But th I think those are the reasons. Firstly, that Engels has been used by the, St the Stalinists, if you like, or the Soviet state theorists as a, an example to justify what was happening in the Soviet Union, a move from, directly from capitalism to socialism. And the second reason then flows that Engels has been distorting what Marx has said and doesn't, didn't understand it and therefore has created uh, this situation where we don't have a really fully developed understanding of the materialist dialectic, historical materialism that Marx had, we had this distorted scientistic view that comes from Engels. I don't agree with either of those arguments. Thanks. Camilla? Um, yeah, on the, why has Engels been 
attacked. I think that's right that these kind of attacks originate, um, I think they kind of originate early, earlier in the 20th century, but particularly with the kind of new left of the 1960s and the 1970s, people that quite rightly wanted to look to Marx to understand the world around them, but didn't want to be associated with the um, interpretation of Marxism that was still uh, influential in the Soviet Union at the time. So sort of um, associated Engels with everything that had gone wrong with Marxism in this in the Soviet Union and said, well, you know, we can we can break from Engels. We'll keep Marx because, you know, Marx is the this kind of subtle dialectical thinker. And let's um, put everything that we think is wrong with some interpretations of Marxism onto the shoulders of of Engels and draw this distinction between the two. Um, and, you know, of course, if many people have said these debates don't really stand up um, if you look at Marx and Engels's works um, that they published in their lifetime, but also if you look historically at the kind of relationship that Marx and Engels had, um, you know, the amount of time that they spent uh, sharing ideas between each other and visiting each other's homes and commenting on each other's work and all of that side of it, you know, all of that points to the idea that they had quite a good understanding of each other's um, work and quite that they were quite united broadly on their their theoretical ideas, although they did diverge a little bit in some of the sort of subject matter that they they discussed. Um, you know, as as we know, I think the other kind of reason is more about what Engels specifically says in the dialectics of nature and I think it's a kind of it's a text you do have to be a bit careful with because it wasn't published in Engels's lifetime it was only published in I think in 1927 in the Soviet Union and then in the 30s by the Communist Party here in in Britain by by Haldane who was kind of around the Communist Party at the time so you get what, what's been published is like a series of kind of notes and fragments of what would have been dialectics of nature you know he, he didn't finish writing it because Marx died and he had other stuff to to do um capital mostly so I mean and some of it is a can be interpreted in a a bit of a kind of mechanistic way I mean particularly the free laws that everyone talks about that there are free laws that nature is supposed to follow the penetration of opposites and the uh the negation of the negation and um you know the trend transition from quality into quantity or, or vice versa um you know the idea that nature kind of follows free laws isn't really um how you'd want to understand the natural world it does kind of uh give the impression that it's just something that we observe from the outside like this kind of clockwork machine that the human just observes but i don't think that is really representative of engels's view if you read who like ludwig feuerbach and the end of classical german philosophy or read yeah, anything that he writes about nature in what we've been talking about today or the um, the part played by Labour that we've mentioned that, you know, is very good. You'll see much more of a dialectical view. You'll see much more of a, a view of the world being made up into processes that crystallise into forms. Uh, and that's a kind of real kind of interpretation of the the dialectic rather than these these sort of laws that nature is supposed to follow. Um yeah, Pritam says, uh, can capitalism be considered superior to pre-capitalist modes from an environmental point of view? Um, yeah, you got me there. Obviously, the answer is is no, capitalism is not superior. You, under, you know, feudalism, you certainly had people changing the quote-unquote natural environment around them by growing stuff and practising agriculture and building things. But you had a qualitative shift with the start of capitalism um, as Many people have pointed out um, the opening of a, a metabolic rift and, and its expansion worldwide. You, have, you know, you only have to look at things like the fossil fuel economy, the way that there's, you know, you have these multinational companies that, um, you know, can, are some of the biggest companies in the world and are compelled by the logic of capitalism, by the need to compete with each other and the need to um, realise realize profits uh, that are capable of changing the very planet that we live in, that, um, you know, to see that capitalism is doing something much more damaging and much more dangerous and much more out of control than any other society that humans have lived in, in before. So, 
it's 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 qualitatively different and qualitatively worse across. Thank you. Um, it seems to be being announced that the um, human monstrosity uh, Trump has uh, been, has officially lost the election. <clears throat> um, so uh, another question here. Oh, I, yes, I just want to give two plugs for people who want to continue the discussion about Engels and dialectics. Firstly, the book by Kan Kangal called uh, Engels and the Dialectics of Nature, which uh, scandalously was not published in the historical materials and book series, but which I'll advertise anyway uh, with Paul Grave. Uh, and he also has an article in the latest issue of um, Three Review, which is a special issue on Engels, <clears throat> not the issue which has all the pro-Chinese regime articles saying how wonderful um, Xi Jinping is, but the following issue. Um, and also wanted to plug the fact that next year the Historical Materialism book series will be publishing a enormous book by Sven Erik Liedmann, um, the Marx uh, and Engels scholar from Sweden, originally published, published in the 1970s called the Play of Contradictions, which is a very detailed study of Engels' um, relationship to 19th century uh, philosophy of uh, science and nature, which I think will be a very important uh, contribution to all of this. We were hoping to publish it this year, but that didn't happen. <coughs> um, Finlay Scott Baxter says, to what extent does a bad understanding of primitive accumulation and its role in capital's genesis lead to an obfuscation of Marx and Engels' approach to nature and the role of fetishism within it? Come on, Michael. Yikes, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, What's the relationship between a proper understanding of primitive accumulation, I assume, and its role in capital's genesis? I, I imagine primitive accumulation is a continuous process rather than a one-off historical event in the past. Right. Uh, oh, what, right. How, how, how does having a misunderstanding of that notion lead to misunderstanding Marx and Engels' approach to nature? I'm not sure where the fetishism comes into it. But. Well, I suppose, I mean, I'll, I'll have a stab at the answer to, to Finley's question. Um, it, the sophistication of the question for me is a little tough. But um, as we know, primitive accumulation is the argument that capital doesn't come onto uh, the stage of history from nowhere. It comes through uh, the process of accumulation that begins much earlier. Through the and as uh, we had in a previous session of historical materialism uh, with Dave McNally's book, it comes through the process of slave society and war and the development that way, and the, the brutal conquest of uh, human beings by other human beings in order to control uh, and own the surplus that, that can be produced for them and to exploit them in this way. But as Marx and Engels' theory of capitalism develops, they are arguing that once we move to a, a mode of production, where production is not based on the conquest of other people and their robbery of other people and the robbery of the soil, to use uh, Marx's phrase, but it's now the process of the commodification of production, production for profit, production for sale, production for turning uh, things that we need into commodities that have to be sold for a profit through the private ownership and control uh, by uh, capitalist uh, entities. It, once we move to that, that, that becomes the dominant form of uh, operation and mode of production globally, not just in a few advanced countries as it was uh, to begin with in the late 18th century and onwards, but becomes the dominant form uh, globally as it is in the early 21st century, then the role of primitive accumulation uh, plays a much less important feature of the nature of exploitation of labor and nature. Yes, no doubt some of that still goes on, but I think we would have, and it clearly does, but I don't accept, perhaps where we're getting here, the theoretical argument that primitive accumulation or uh, exploitation by dispossession, if you like, to use another phrase, is the dominant way in which 
exploitation takes place un under modern economies in the 21st century. As far as I'm concerned, the major formula, if ever it was, is the capitalist mode of production, as it's described by and developed by Marx and Engels, particularly Marx in Capital and Other Works, is the dominant form of the mode of production of exploitation, and that this is the form that now dominates the world. It's moved on beyond just a few advanced economies into a whole imperialist complex with a financial uh, car sitting on top of that, providing the redistribution of this capital and the control of it. This is, this is the thing that we must understand in a very clear way. Um, and that primitive accumulation, which we talked about in the emergence of capital, capital is something that we it helps us to explain how capitalism arrived, but it's not the key uh, mode of understanding of the nature of exploitation and the contradictions in capitalism now. You want to respond to that, Camilla? Or? Uh, I don't have a huge amount to add to what, what Michael has said, really. I think there are clearly ongoing um, processes of uh, what you might call robbery from nature that um, John Bellamy Foster and Brett Clark have talked about in their their recent book. And I think it's important to recognise that it's linked to processes of um, exploitation of workers. Um, but I think that, you know, there's much confusion between the two uh, in some kind of Marxist accounts uh, where they try to argue that uh, non-human nature is, is exploited. So I think we do need to kind of hang on to the, the distinction between the two, as, as Michael says, that it's, it's not, you know, making a, a kind of moral um, argument that only exploitation of workers matters, but it is saying that there is something distinctive about that process and that it is a, a driving force in the in the development of capitalism, that there's a particularly, there's a particular contradiction around exploitation of, of workers that, uh, and them being paid less than the full value of their their wage labour that that is very important to to sort of see as as central. Um, I'm not sure if that really answers the, the question. I didn't really understand the question much either. Okay, thank you. Um, there aren't any more questions uh, unless I get one immediately from Sean. So, do either of you have any um, concluding things you want to say? Oh. One's just turned up. Mike Breen did. Engels, um, oh, sorry, Mike Breen. Did Engels discuss the role of technology in capitalism? There are many on the right who see technocratic solutions to the climate crisis. Well, yes, indeed he did, uh, uh, Mike, that um, in the condition of the working class in England book, he discusses in some detail the role of machines versus labor. And he makes the point, and I actually deal with it in the book that I've just published in some depth, that uh, technology and the pr process of using machines uh, to increase the productivity of labor, but also displace labor, gives you two results. It gives you the result of more productivity, which doesn't uh, come about, uh, doesn't result in less working hours for people, in fact, the worst, but creates unemployment alongside just as long a working house as a contradiction arises. So technology and machinery in that sense is damaging to labor. And that is why I met uh, wage laborers in the 1840s who conducted campaigns against uh, technology in some ways, but also uh, struggled to sustain their share of the value that it's created. But he also, Engels also says, that it's contradictory in another sense that uh, while workers in some in old industries are displaced by new technology industries, then employment is also created by those new technology industries. So there's that, there's that continual contradiction between labor displacement and labor jobs creation at the same time. Of course, this means that workers, working class is not in control of this process. Only the ruling uh, capitalists are in control of this process. So the result is that it develops what Marx, what Engels called for the first time before Marx, an industrial reserve army on what, upon which capital relies to discipline workers, but also to sustain low as, low as possible wage costs 
while developing uh, technology and machinery. So uh, in the condition of the working class, uh, which again I mentioned should read, it's, it's not a hard book to read. Uh, it's a hard book to realize some of the experiences, but it's not hard to read. And in that sense, you can see the, the, where Engels develops many of the early concepts that Marx takes up later in Capital, like the Reserve Army of Labour uh, and other, and the need for trade unions and working class to organize so that they really have the control over this process of technology, which of course we know they do not still now. Um, yeah, I think the Reserve Army of Labour is a really important counter to uh, Thomas Malthus in Marx and Engels' day as well, which we've barely touched on, but of course population still comes up in debates around the environment. They're really clear that the, po the problem isn't that there's too many people and too little food to go around. The problem is specific to capitalist society, that there's plenty of food, but there's all these unemployed people that can't afford to buy it. Um, and that's why they're, you know, they're unemployed um, and, uh, and, you know, can't feed themselves. It's, you know, they recognise that laws of population are specific to the kind of society that you live in. And you know, technology plays a big role in throwing those people out of work uh, in Marx and Engels' day, and I'm sure still today. So those are really important arguments. And I think um, the questioner also asked about technocratic solutions to the climate crisis and I think we should be very suspicious of these ideas um you know not that you know technology has no role to play in anything we're all using technology now or trying to uh but you know the idea that you can simply step in and solve the climate crisis by bringing in new technology whether it's you know geoengineering or um whichever kind of technology and not address the social and historical roots of the problem and you know, not address the reasons why we have this climate crisis in the first place, I think is incredibly problematic and, and quite dangerous really. And you know, it's a way of using climate change to further kind of create profit for a, a small minority of people and continue the, uh, the exploitation and oppression that has led to the problem um, in the first place. Okay. Thanks very much. Do either of you have any concluding things you wanted to add? All I would just like to do a piano praise for uh, Engels' work, sadly neglected, and I hope that uh, everybody who's uh, watched this today will take up some of the uh, books that Camilla has mentioned and uh, you've mentioned, Sid, in, in, uh, on Engels, which help them to understand his contribution. Uh, and that people should read Engels' works. Uh, don't forget, it's not just the... He's many, many concepts uh, that Engels dealt with that Marx actually develops and re regard as Marx's ideas, like the theory of rent, like the idea of cycles of boom and slump, like the term fictitious capital, which is one that uh, is very prominent in the, in the financial crisis we have now, the idea of concentration and centralization of capital, uh, the superiority of a planned economy, all these things, and even, I'm talking about imperialism and war, all these things that Engels developed, which I don't think we know enough about, and we don't realise it can make a, a help us to understand uh, the materialist process that's going on under capitalism uh, and all the contradictions that are involved, involved in that. So I would urge people to read his works uh, and not just the stuff we've been talking about today on the dialectics of nature. Uh yeah, read Engels' work and um, thanks for recommending the other works. That, that Burkett paper is is really good and one I, I drew on a lot for my PhD. But also, yeah, I think people should get involved in some of these movements around climate change as well. I mean, the climate strikes have gone a bit online at the moment and are a bit reduced. But these you know, debates are going to keep coming back. Um, we don't know what Biden's going to do. He'll probably join the... Um, the COP process again, but that's hardly going to solve the problems that we face. Um, there'll be huge protests, I'm sure, um, if, if possible, next year around around COP26. And you know, I think there's a real there's a real radicalism in within these protests and a real kind of opportunity for for Marxists and socialists and people who want to to um, 
to tear the head off the capitalist system to get involved in these and speak to the the young people that are involved in them. Okay, thanks very much, Camilla. So I uh, remind you all, Roberts, uh, Michael Roberts' book on Engels is um, available from the self-publishing firm Lulu.com, and um, I sent an email around to the HM email list, so you should have a link uh, if you're on that list to be able to buy it. Uh, Camilla's book Engels for Rebels is available from Bookmarks. Um, I think they probably are able to send it to you by mail. Um, and uh, indeed, this was the year of Engels' anniversary. Um, Tarek Ali had the excellent idea uh, last year before the pandemic that we should use it as an occasion to go and um, take over his favorite pub in Highgate, to <laughs> celebrate in true Engelsian style. Sadly, that won't be possible this year, uh, <laughs> but perhaps next year we will be able to um, make up for it. Anyway, thank you very much, both of you, for this session. Um, and I remind you uh, all who are watching uh, that the session on uh, 2020 US election, bourgeois democracy in crisis, um, is starting at 18.30 uh, GMT. And that's with uh, Kali Akunu, uh, Megan Day, and Peter Drucker. Right on cue. <laughs> Sorry? Right on cue, just say. <laughs> yes, indeed, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I encourage you all to, uh, to participate in that session. Thanks very much. And I remind you all, of course, to take up our 25% discount offer, which is only 59 euros, 25 cents, for a thousand pages of historical materialism journal published four times a year. And, of course, the Haymarket uh, paperbacks of the historical materials and book, say, uh, book series are currently having a 50% discount sale uh, and books that are included in that are for example the book by Burkett and Bellamy Foster, Marks on Earth. Anyway, thank you very much and uh, onward and upward. Subscribe to Historical Materialism Journal Buy books in the Historical Materials and Book series and get back to work.